Thank you. It's good to be back with you again. Um, seems like I'm working with Maine or Massachusetts or <laughs> Maine or Massachusetts all the time. It's good. We're involved with the 28th Amendment program to get uh, an amendment to the Constitution to nullify Citizens United. And the, the real germ of that movement is Maine. So much foreign money has poured into Maine for elections that uh, they've never seen anything like it. But tonight, I wanted to talk about uh, the three things that are on my mind, and I'm sure on your mind too. Um, as mentioned and is in the title, the crisis in Ukraine, nuclear weapons and the climate crisis. But let me start by saying that yesterday I did a very intense hour with uh, 11 or 12 of the senior non-resident fellows of which I'm one at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft on Taiwan. So let me not for a moment forget that that is a crisis right now too. Um, not quite as in our face as Ukraine, perhaps, but with Xi Jinping having cleared the Politburo of most people who might question what he wanted to do or wants to do, is becoming as serious as potentially any other crisis that we might be looking at. It means a war with China. And having abandoned strategic ambiguity for strategic clarity, which I think was sheer lunacy, we are uh, courting a real problem with regard to our ability even to, if it were to happen, if China were to invade Taiwan or some other untoward military action, we'd have a hard time doing it. Tonight, Ukraine, nuclear weapons, and the climate crisis. Why those three for me? They're connected, they're very connected. Let me show you how they're connected by going to the two heads of delegation, one of them a really courageous young man, of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, which met and released its, uh, its most recent report on 28 February, only four days after the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin and Russian forces. And this is what, I wanna get this straight, this is what the two delegates said. Svetlana Krasikovska, Ukraine's head of delegation said, quote, human-induced climate change and the war in Ukraine have the same roots fossil fuels and our dependence on them. And then she went on to elaborate how we were looking at an existential crisis because of those fossil fuels, largely because of those fossil fuels. And then Oleg Anisimov, the Russian head of de delegation had this to say, and think about the courage it took for this young man to say this, and I hope he's still alive. Quote, let me present an apology. Remember the invasion started four days earlier. Let me present an apology on behalf of all Russians not able to prevent this conflict. Those who see what is happening fail to find any justification for the attack on Ukraine, end of quote. Well, I find some justification for it, as many of you who followed my remarks over the last seven or eight years know, in that uh, Bill Clinton's expansion of NATO and our follow-up with that, all the way to my president going to Tbilisi, Georgia, and announcing to all and sundry from the public square that Georgia would be a member of NATO. And you may recall Putin invaded shortly after that and took the two northern uh, oblasts of Georgia and still occupies them pretty much. Um, this is insanity that we had something to do with creating. And I'm not even gonna talk about the 2014 coup we pulled off in Ukraine or the 2006 effort that led the way to that 2014 coup. So the Ukraine conflict is not as American media, Western media in general, NATO media specifically, has been depicting it. It's all been propagandized. It's a fault on both sides. Now, I'm not trying to condone Ukraine or condone Putin for invading Ukraine, but I am saying that uh, there is more fault to go around. A lot of hypocrisy lying on the street all over the place. Why is Ukraine and the climate crisis and nuclear weapons connected, though? Well, let's back up for a moment. We all know that Putin has said, and Russian doctrine actually reflects, reflects now, that he might use a nuclear weapon. While we all think that's probably braggadocio and not going to happen, we all hope that anyway, there is a remote possibility that he might be serious about it, particularly if he feels he's like, likely to fall from power. But why do I say right now, it's a very bad time to be developing this sort of scenario? because we have abandoned all of our nuclear weapons treaties. We, the United States of America, started it under my president, George W. Bush, when we abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty. 
And that wasn't enough for us. We abandoned the Open Skies Treaty. We abandoned the Conventional Force in Europe, Forces in Europe Treaty. We abandoned the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty. The only treaty, as my old boss Colin Powell used to say, which, quote, rid us of an entire class of very dangerous nuclear weapons, unquote. He would say that to me consistently and constantly because he was very proud of that as the National Security Advisor to Ronald Reagan when it actually happened. And we are, an, in effect, eliminating the last remaining Cold War nuclear weapons treaty, the New START treaty, because can anyone imagine Putin, who is required to do this, renewing it? Now that we've established this wonderful dialogue we have with Moscow, um, I don't see it being reestablished. And guess what Joe Biden did and what Joe Biden is still, or Barack Obama did, and Joe Biden is probably going to continue. And that is a trillion plus dollars on new nuclear weapons and modernization of the ones that we have to include more destabilizing ballistic nuclear weapons. That is to say, ones that my military commanders now out there are saying have utility again. I think I'm back in 1952 or 53 when generals around Ike Eisenhower were essentially saying that, oh, these are just bigger cap guns. They just have a bigger explosion on the battlefield. We can use these. That's what people were saying at that time in the military leadership and some civilians too. Well, I'm hearing that again, that battlefield weapons, that is tactical nuclear weapons have utility. That's insanity. If we learn nothing from the Cold War, it was you use one, you're probably going to use them all. Now, we have succeeded in reducing stockpiles, and thank Colin Powell for that, because he negotiated the Moscow Treaty, which took the Russians from some 30,000 and us from some 28,000, yes, almost 60,000 nuclear warheads between us, down to around, oh, 5,000, 6,000 a day, which is plenty dangerous enough, and it's enough to wipe the world out. But we were going down to 1,200 under that treaty until on both sides until this latest developments and the invasion of ukraine has just put a kibosh on that for sure how is all this connected to the climate crisis well as the two heads of delegation from ukraine and russia respectively indicated this is distracting from the much bigger crisis that we ought to all be confronting indeed should have been confronting for the last three decades at least and that's the climate crisis. Now, this is not a crisis that the earth feels too bad about. I don't imagine if the earth feels anything. And I'm one who believes that perhaps she does. The earth is going to cast us off just like it cast the dinosaurs off. And it will go on four and a half, five billion more years until it spins out its existence, crashing into our sun. That's the geological time scale on it. But we won't be here. We won't be here because we are stupid. We are dunces, we are idiots. As one scientist said to me at the Climate Security Working Group, we have the technology. We certainly have the technology, the know-how to save ourselves. The question is, do we have the wisdom to execute that saving? And his implications and my understanding right now is we may not have. Um, the earth will not care one whit, it'll just go on and maybe some other life form will develop, but we won't be here. The human life form won't be here. And why do I say that? I say that because even if you, if you read the technical section of the IPCC report released on 28 February, the technical section, not the summary now, the summary has to be approved by every single country, some 75 countries, as I recall. The technical section is written by scientists. You read that section, you'll understand that in 2050, you might not want to live on this earth in certain areas. Indeed, right now, you might not, not want to live in Basra, Iraq. You might want, not want to live in Syria, where the worst droughts in a thousand years have occurred three, four years in a row now. Think about why the Syrian civil war started. You might not want to live in some of the places right now that are releasing refugees to the tune of, are you ready for this? 178 million in the world right now. Now our simulations show there are going to be 500 million, half a billion refugees by mid-century, that half of them are going to be under 40 and that half of that half is going to be probably male and be armed with a Kalashnikov an AK-47, and at least 20 rounds of ammunition, and the pure powers running from roughly Tokyo, across Los Angeles, across Washington, across London, 
and to Moscow and to Beijing, the peer powers are gonna be putting their military forces on their southern borders and shooting people. That's how serious this situation is going to get. The global South is already experiencing climate change. And guess what? The global South doesn't give a hang about Ukraine. Poll them, go talk to them and ask them. They think our focus on Ukraine is nonsense. Here we are, the peer powers who have contaminated this world majorly, not them, we have majorly with our fossil fuel burning and they're paying the piper for it. They don't think Ukraine is worth a hangman's noose. They're looking at their lives, they're looking at their families, they're looking at no water, no food and subsistence level already. They're looking at Ukraine even causing grain and other products from even flowing the way they were in the past. God help us if Putin steps in again and tries to interfere with the food that is finally moving out of Ukraine because they were the breast bread basket, bread basket. Lebanon was getting 50% of its grain from Ukraine and Russia. Um, this is a very serious crisis, but it's not nearly as serious as the one that it's diverting us from and diverting money from. We've already spent close to a trillion dollars on Ukraine. Think of what that could do. Think of what it could do with any of the problems we have right now in education and in, in, in drugs and so forth. If we applied that money wisely elsewhere, think of what it could do if we applied it, at least part of it, to meeting the climate change, doing the things that we have to do. So you got Ukraine, which is possibly leading to a use of a nuclear weapon, hopefully not, but even at the same time, it's killing a lot of people and it doesn't need to be doing that. Let's stop this stupid war. Let's do something we haven't done in a long time. Let's reach a diplomatic solution. Let's stop it. Yeah, yeah. Both of us need to eat a little crow, maybe, and we need to do some recognizing of the other's interest and so forth, but we need to stop this thing. We need to get it over with because it's distracting us from the other two crises. And the first thing we need to do with nuclear weapons is bring all nine countries, Israel, Pakistan, India, Israel kicking and screaming if we have to do it into the nuclear weapons regime, into the treaty regime and bring North Korea in too. We have to have arms control treaties in order to even have a, a modicum of a chance to get through the next 20 years without exchanging some of these weapons, which I think will probably be the end of us all too. Might climate change might just go ahead and happen and there won't be anybody to be influenced by it in the human realm anyway, because we'll have already eliminated ourselves with nuclear weapons. So these crises are connected. And I started with China, let me end with China. That's connected too. I have never played a war game, participated in a war game at any level in the military without going to war with China over Taiwan or the South China Sea or whatever in the war game, simulated of course, without it turning nuclear. Now, on this discussion that we had the other day, one of the experts said, no, 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 it doesn't have to go nuclear. I participated in games where it didn't go nuclear. It doesn't have to go nuclear. Well, of course it doesn't have to. But if you're sitting there with about two thirds of your Navy down, two thirds of your Air Force down, and by the way, one carrier that's 5,000 Americans dead. In the first day of war with China, there'd be 100,000 casualties. There'd be 100,000 casualties. When's the last time Americans even thought about 100,000 casualties? You tell me that you're gonna take those kinds of losses and the Chinese are gonna take those kinds of losses and you're not gonna contemplate nuclear weapons, make Ukraine look like a sand pile in terms of this war. So I'll end with that and tell you, you don't want war with China either. And we have an administration even now, and one I suspect coming in 2024, and maybe mm, this month with regard to the Congress, which is gonna be very bellicose with regard to China. And that's extremely dangerous. So we are living in a world full of crises. Thank you.